But welcome to the Holy Land in the site of the walls of Jerusalem. So in this video, we're gonna be taking you all around the walls of Jerusalem, the current walls, but we're also gonna take you back in time and we're gonna show you the history of how the walls were during the times of the Canaanites, David, Solomon, uh, after Solomon, Hezekiah, Nehemiah, the walls during the time of Christ, and then the walls after the time of Christ, and then how they are today along with the gates. So I think you'll find this video very enlightening to show you what the walls were like all throughout the history. Also, as a special treat, during the second half of the video, we'll be looking at the current walls and gates of Old City, Jerusalem. So follow along and enjoy this video of the walls of Jerusalem. Now the first walls of Jerusalem were built by the Canaanites some 5,000 years ago. So long before the Israelites entered the Promised Land, the Jebusites lived securely within the walls of Jerusalem. The city was blessed with natural valleys around it that made it easy to defend. The city walls and its fortress provided additional protection. The long history of Jerusalem began well before it was captured by King David and made into the capital of the people of Israel some 3,000 years ago. Archaeological findings indicate the existence of a settlement in Jerusalem in the third millennium or 3,000 years before Christ. The first mention of the city in historical sources begins in the second millennium BC or once again 2,000 years before Christ. The location of the ancient Canaanite city of Jerusalem was chosen specifically for its natural protective qualities. The hill on which early Jerusalem was built has natural fortifications from three directions. The deep Kidron Valley from the east, or also known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and then to the west was the Hinnom Valley, also known as the Teropian Valley. And the lowland where the two valleys met to the south is down in the place located south of the city of Jerusalem down in a deep valley which goes down to the Dead Sea. The only side that isn't naturally protected is the north. And this has been a problem that has accompanied ancient Jerusalem throughout its history and is even mentioned in biblical passages such as the words of Jeremiah and from the north shall come the evil. Jeremiah 1.14 During the time of the Israel conquest, initially the city of Jerusalem was captured, but not fully. And then when David came on the scene in about 1000 BC, then it was he who was able to conquer the city and enlarge it. God was with David and allowed him to capture Jerusalem from the Jebusites. Later, he built additional walls to fortify the city. The Gihon Spring was outside the city at this time, and the city became known as the City of David. Jerusalem's ancient water source was and always has been the Gihon Spring on the east side of the City of David in the Valley of Jehoshaphat or the Kidron Valley. In 2 Samuel 5, 6, God tells us about how David captured the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, you will not come up here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking, David cannot come in here. So they were mocking David and said, you will never take this city. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him give up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into this house. And David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built the city all around from the Milo inward. And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. So in this passage we see here that the Jebusites are mocking David 
And then David comes up through the water shaft of the Gihon Spring and captures the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites from within the city, coming up from underneath of the city. Right here is where it all began, my dear friends. This is where God's plan to establish the temple and his speaking to the people and residing in this special place of Jerusalem about 3,000 years ago. And it will be the place where Christ is going to reign during the millennial reign. And this is the place where the prophets and the priests have ministered from. But it all began in the city of David. Now you can see the southern stairs here and you can see the temple uh, mount platform. The city of David ran from just below or even connecting to the southern stairs there, running down along the ridge, down to the Hinnom Valley and where the Kidron Valley meet. In fact, down at the tip down there is where the Pool of Siloam is, and that would be the lower part of the city of David. You can see right here, there's uh, this wall here, this ancient wall. It's believed that that's what uh, Nehemiah fortified. There's a kind of a tower there. Uh, that's where a watch uh, place was, a lookout was. So this is the city of David, and this is what uh, David conquered about 3,000 years ago. Then after the time of David, then Solomon comes on the scene and he adds to the walls of the city of Jerusalem. So David dies and then Solomon built a temple on the threshing floor of Aruna or Ornan and he enlarged the Temple Mount platform and added walls from the city of David to the Temple Mount. So he enlarged, he built this temple platform, he built the temple which was glorious and then he enlarged the city walls so that it would encompass the city of David and the platform, the Temple Mount, where the new temple was that he had built. Around 700 BC, then Hezekiah enlarged the city of Jerusalem in a big way. What was happening was that the northern ten tribes of Israel, the northern part of Israel, was falling to the Assyrians as had been prophesied by God. He had sent them prophet after prophet after prophet warning them, but they did not listen. So God fulfilled his word, the prophecies, and the Assyrians moved in and took over the north. As they were doing that, many people fled from the north and sought refuge in Jerusalem. And so they settled in what is called the western side of the city of Jerusalem. So when the Assyrians were getting closer and threatening to take Jerusalem and the southern part of the nation of Israel, which was called Judah, then Hezekiah went into a massive, quick, frenzied building program and he built what was called Hezekiah's Broad Wall. It's named that because of how wide it is. It was built quick and it encompassed the whole western side of the city of David and Jerusalem. So there was a massive expansion then under King Hezekiah. In 2 Chronicles 32, 5, it says about Hezekiah, he set to work resolutely and built up the wall that was broken down. So he repaired what did exist and raised towers upon it. And outside it, he built another wall. So this is the expansion, talking about the expansion. And he strengthened the Milo in the city of David. He also made weapons and shields in abundance. So Hezekiah's new wall measured 22 feet wide, or about 7 meters wide, by about 25 feet high, or 8 meters high. It was a massive undertaking and measured around 2.5 miles in length, or about 4 kilometers. A portion of the wall was discovered in the 1970s by Israeli archaeologist Naaman Abigad and dated to the reign of King Hezekiah, which was about 716 to 687 BC. It was called Hezekiah's Broad Wall by archaeologists because of its width. Hezekiah also built a water tunnel in order to keep the water from the Gihon Spring inside the city walls so the Assyrians couldn't cut off the water supply. The curving tunnel is 583 yards or about 533 meters long and has a fall of exactly 
12 inches or 30 centimeters between its two ends, the beginning and the lower part, which winds up down at the pool of Siloam. It was chiseled from both ends to the middle at the same time, and it took the water from the Gihon Spring under the mountain to the pool of Siloam below the city. Later, then Nehemiah rebuilt the city walls of Jerusalem. So when the Babylonians conquered and destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC, they also destroyed the walls and burned the gates with fire. However, God sovereignly moved in the heart of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, to allow Nehemiah to rebuild the walls later on. It says in Nehemiah 1, Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. So Nehemiah was in Babylon, and his brothers came to him and reported the news of what was happening in Jerusalem. And they said, The remnant there in the province who survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. So Nehemiah rebuilds this wall, and it was a massive, amazing miracle. It says in Nehemiah 6, 15, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished by the help of our Lord. Nehemiah didn't change the existing walls of Hezekiah, but just repaired those that existed. Some 275 years after Nehemiah, there was a Hasmonean wall addition. The Jews gained their independence from the Seleucid Empire in around 167 BC, and they gained it under the Maccabeans and the Hasmoneans. At this time, Jerusalem began to be rebuilt along with its walls. During this period, a wall was added to the northern part of the existing wall. It would be this city layout that would exist during the time of Christ. In 63 BC, the Romans conquered the Jews and made several major changes in Jerusalem. Herod the Great enlarged the Temple Mount to its current size. The Antonia Fortress was also built that was beside the Temple Mount for protection purposes. And the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the believed place where Christ was crucified, buried, and rose again, was located outside the city walls at this time. From 37 to 70 AD, the walls of Jerusalem swelled to the north. So Herod Agrippa I laid the foundation for an expansion of the walls of Jerusalem to the north. Agrippa I began the construction of an additional wall of the city, which was completed at the beginning of the First Jewish-Roman War in 66 AD. This would be the largest area the city walls would ever encompass in Jerusalem's history. In 70 AD, the Jews revolted against the Romans, and the city and the temple were burned and leveled. This fulfilled Christ's prophecy regarding the destruction of Jerusalem because of the Jews' rejection of Christ as their Messiah. Later, in around 132 AD, the Jews revolted again against the Romans. Hadrian, the Roman emperor, ordered the city to be totally destroyed and renamed. It was then called Aelia Capitolina, and Israel was renamed to Palestine, which comes from the word Philistines. This was done in an attempt to eradicate any association of Jerusalem and Israel with the Jews. After some two centuries without walls, new walls were erected around the city, probably during the reign of Emperor Diocletian, sometime between 289 AD and the turn of the century. The walls were then extensively renewed later on by the Empress Aelia Eodosia, 
during her banishment to Jerusalem in around 443 to 460 AD. It should be mentioned, however, that the original walls that existed during the time of Christ were never completely destroyed. Therefore, some of the walls that exist today are from this time period. Newer walls have been built upon them, but parts of the original walls, as mentioned, are from the time of Christ. A good example of this is part of the Western Wall, or also known as the Wailing Wall. The walls of Jerusalem would then be rebuilt and torn down until the time of Suleiman the Magnificent arrived on the scene in the 1500s. The city walls that exist today were built in the 16th century under Suleiman the Magnificent. He decided to rebuild the city walls on much of the remains of the ancient walls that already existed. They were completed in 1538 and are the walls of the city today. And you will notice in these walls that about halfway up the walls kind of change. The lower part is generally the older part of the walls. And then the new part, or the part that you can see usually with smaller stones and sometimes haphazardly laid, is the newer part. Now the walls of Jerusalem today are glorious and majestic. We'll take a look at each section of the city walls now. We'll start with the western city wall side and then see the northern, eastern, and southern sides of the city walls. Along the way, we'll highlight the city gates and a few outstanding places. In another video, we'll talk about the history and show you in more detail each city gate that exists today, along with a few that existed in the time of Jesus that no longer exist. The western side of the walls of Jerusalem are spectacular in beauty. One notable place along this wall is the believed place where Christ was tried and condemned to crucifixion. Herod's palace was located just inside this wall and it's believed Pilate was using it when Christ was brought before him. The Jaffa Gate is also on this side of the wall. It's the largest and one of the most used gates of the city. It was built by Suleiman the Magnificent in 1538. It marked the end of the highway that led from Jaffa or the Joppa port on the Mediterranean Ocean to Jerusalem. A large opening in the wall was made right beside the original gate that still exists today. In 1898, when Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany visited Jerusalem, the ruling Ottoman Turks opened it up so the German emperor would not have to dismount his carriage to enter the city. Today, this opening allows cars to enter the old city between Jaffa Gate and the city of David. This gate leads into the Christian and Armenian quarters of the old city. The northern city wall section is the longest and has the most gates. This side of the wall was always the weakest side to protect because the terrain slopes uphill from here. For this reason, most of the battles that were fought took place on this side. It was here that the Romans entered to conquer Jerusalem in 70 AD. The first gate in the section of this wall is the New Gate. It carries this name because it was constructed in 1898 and is the newest gate. It was built with permission of Sultan Abdul Hamid II and is located near the northwestern corner of the city. It leads into the Christian quarter. The next gate is the Damascus Gate. It is one of the busiest and certainly the most magnificent of all Jerusalem's gates. The gate consists of one large center gate originally intended for use by persons of high station or high prominence and two smaller side entrances for the common people. It's the main entrance into the Muslim quarter of the city today. Just after the Damascus Gate is Zedekiah's Cave, or also known as Solomon's Quarries. This is a massive underground cave that was used for quarrying large limestones used in the walls of Jerusalem. It encompasses five acres, or 2.5 hectares, that runs the length of five city blocks under the Muslim quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. 
Next is Herod's Gate. It connects the Muslim quarter inside the old city to a Palestinian neighborhood just inside. It is a short distance to the east of the Damascus Gate. The eastern wall section of the old city is quite majestic and faces the Mountain of Olives which rises up and the Kidron Valley which falls below it. The Temple Mount, where the temple was once located, shares part of this side of the wall. The Lion's Gate is located in this section of the wall. The entrance also leads to the famous Via Dolorosa. Near the gate's crest are four figures of lions, two on the left and two on the right. Legend has it that Sultan Suleiman placed the figures there because he believed that if he did not construct a wall around Jerusalem, he would be killed by lions. Israeli paratroopers famously stormed through this gate during the Six-Day War to conquer the Temple Mount, after which they unfurled the Israeli flag above the Old City. The Eastern Gate, also known as the Golden Gate, was the main entrance to the original temple during the time of Jesus. Jesus used this gate regularly when he was in Jerusalem to teach on the Temple Mount area. Now this Eastern Gate has played a significant role in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, and it will play, according to many scholars, an important role in prophesied future events as well. Now during the time of Christ, there was a bridge that was from here of the Eastern Gate, and it would span over the Kidron Valley and wind up over towards the Mount of Olives. That way people didn't have to go down the Kidron Valley and back up. So right here, right directly under this gate, this is a newer gate, about 500 years old, but right directly under it, it has been found, was the original gate. So Christ would have walked right through here on a regular basis, especially the last week of his ministry. He would come back and forth, staying on the Mount of Olives, and then ministering right here in the, on the Temple Mount. So this plays a real key role in the Bible. According to Jewish tradition, the Messiah will enter Jerusalem through this gate when he returns. To prevent this, the Muslims sealed the gate during the rule of Suleiman and built a cemetery by it. Of course, we know that Jesus the Messiah already entered through this gate, and when he returns, no cemetery will stop him from re-entering this gate. The southern wall section of the old city has some significant places along it. The most notable is the southern steps area. This was the main entrance to the Temple Mount during the time of Christ, and it is what connected the city of David to the Temple Mount. Right here, this group of people, can you say hi? They are sitting on the very stairs. They are called the rabbi stairs that went up to the Temple Mount during Christ's time. And these are the very stairs upon which Christ would have walked, upon which he would have taught his disciples, and also upon which the Apostle Paul would have learned under Gamaliel, one of the most famous rabbis in Jerusalem and in the Apostle Paul's time. Today, all of the original gates from the southern stairs have been closed off. There was no doubt that Jesus would have used these stairs and taught his disciples here as well. There are also hundreds of mikvahs, which are Jewish purification pools, by these stairs that were used for purification purposes and likely used as well at Pentecost for the 3,000 that were saved and then got baptized. The Dung Gate is located along this section of the wall and is the closest in proximity to the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, which is in the Jewish quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. The gate received its name because refuse or trash was hauled out of the city through this gate. Just up from the Dung Gate is the Zion Gate. It was one of the main gates used by the Israeli Defense Forces in 1967 to enter and capture the old city. The stones surrounding the gate are still marked by weapons of fire, and you can see the holes and all these damaged parts in this gate area. 
Now what can we learn as a faith lesson from the history of Jerusalem and its walls and gates? Well, according to many passages in the Bible, God still has a plan for the Jews. Scripture contains many prophecies about how God would bring them back to their homeland after being scattered for thousands of years. He also says that during the Great Tribulation period that many, if not most of them, will recognize that Jesus is indeed their Messiah and turn to Him in repentance. Amazingly, we see the first prophecy fulfilled in that the Jews return to their homeland and now have their own country. There have been many civilizations that have occupied the Holy Land, but God has fulfilled prophecy in bringing the Jews back to their homeland today. The stones here cry out that God's word is true and is verifiable through the fulfillment of these prophecies. There is a statement found in the Southern Stair area of the Temple Mount that summarizes the history and walls of this magnificent chosen city. Here's this wonderful phrase and listen to it carefully. The Jerusalem stone, so resilient and supple, bows to the transient follies of humankind, bearing a testimony like a hundred witnesses and yet remain silent. This is the place, this is the city, where God has decided to dwell in a special way. It's also the place where He will return to in power and great glory at His second coming. And it will be the place from which He will reign during the millennial reign of Christ on this earth after the great tribulation period and before the destruction of the current heavens and earth and the creation of new heavens and earth. If God has fulfilled countless prophecies regarding Jerusalem, the Jewish nation, Christ's first coming, and the regathering of Israel back to her homeland, then we can rest assured that every other prophecy in the Bible will be fulfilled as well. Therefore, we should be living lives that are pleasing to the Lord and awaiting His return. Well, I hope that you have found this talk and this video helpful. Hope you found it enlightening. So thank you for watching and may God bless you.